Wa guan, everybody. Welcome to the Dis Afimi History Podcast, where we'll be speaking about history and as well family history and how history relates in terms of Caribbean people um, for the present as well as in the past and how in the past what that does and brings forth for what we are going through at present and what we can learn from our history, from our family, and take that moving forward. So I do hope you enjoy the podcast. And if you like it, please ensure to subscribe, like, and review. Thank you. In this episode, we welcome back Dr. Justine Collins, who is a legal historian, to discuss her paper on the impact of the British parliamentary legislation on enslaved women. So let's have a listen. Thank you so much, Justine, for coming back on onto the podcast to speak on your article about the impact of British parliamentary legislation on enslaved women of the British uh, Caribbean, because these are, this is a topic that's not really talked about women in particular, right, in history, and much less enslaved women. So, mm. you know, this is a um, a huge topic, and it definitely, we wouldn't be here if it was for them at, at first, but Let's let's start with that. So, as you indicated in your article, there was three phases. Can you provide the listeners on each of the phases? Sure. So, thanks for having me again. Um, I'll first just talk a little bit about amelioration, just so mm-hmm. people know what it means. Um, so, it was, in a sense, uh, a set of legal and social reforms um, with the objective of alleviating um, the conditions of slavery. And so... There was initially two phases. So the first phase um, began in the late 1700s to just before the end of the state trade, 1807. And this phase was primarily um, planter-driven, particularly the planter named Edward Long. And he was a Jamaican planter and a lobbyist for the West India Company. So Long drafted um, ameliorative measures in 1774 which he based on the French Code Noir. Mm-hmm. Um, he felt the measures were necessary for the improvement and the regulatory treatment of unsafe people. Yeah. Now, the reason why he would have chosen the Code Noir is because, so the Code Noir was a, the French slave code, and it was always thought to be much more um, lenient mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and enslaved friendly than the British codes. For instance, it allowed marriage, it al- allowed baptismal, it allowed, even though there were punishments for enslaved people, um, they could complain if they felt a punishment was excessive. Yeah. And this was something unheard of, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, in the British Caribbean. So I believe he felt like he can base, if he based some measures, these ameliorative measures on that, it would automatically improve, um, you know, the conditions of the slave. Yeah. And so the main objective of this phase was to improve the material existence of the enslaved persons, mm-hmm. um, to reduce mortality, and to promote, which is most essential for our discussion today, what they called the natural healthy yes. increase of enslaved children. Because they knew, the planters were very much aware that um, there were all this lobbying by abolition, uh, abolitionists and um, the abolitionist agenda mm-hmm. in, in, in England. And also you had these cases that arose and these big figures like Granville Sharp, um, who advocated for, you know, slavery to end. And you had the cases of the Zong with the, the enslaved were thrown overboard because they said they, they had not enough much, um water for everybody and then they had a somerset case who was an enslaved person that went to england and tried to uh went to granville shop and him because he didn't want to be a a slave anymore you know and they set him free so you had all these things coming up and so the planters started realizing okay something must be done (laughs) because Mm -hmm. they're going to try and end the slave trade and prior to this prior to the the slave trade coming to an end they never looked to enslaved women to naturally increase their conditions weren't great. They never paid attention to their fertility or the ways or means they gave birth to make sure that they did not do hard labor during this time. So um, it was quite a 360 move yeah. um, at this period to then try to focus on them and their lives. 
So um, this ameliorative period concentrated on um, Jamaica, Grenada, and Leeward Islands. They instituted elements of um, Edward Long's draft into their um, slavery codes, the ameliorative codes of the Slavery Act. And they saw to, you know, um, have uh, better treatment for um, pregnant women. Um, there was the first law that basically said that a white uh, settler could not obtrude the personal life yep. <laughs> of, an, of an enslaved woman, which was really big, yes. extremely big, because it, they never addressed this before. There would be laws saying, okay, let's not have um, interracial uh, mixing, but to state that it's an, you know, up, this person has been an, an uh, obstruction of a uh, personal family life. It's it's yeah. it's quite a, a big deal. Mm -hmm. So you had that. You had them um, advocating for rest days for yes. enslaved women and so forth. So this was the focus of the first the first phase. Yeah. Um. The second phase would be post eighteen oh seven. And this um, was made by a uh, parliamentary order in council. And this one was abolitionist driven. Um, whereas the first was um, planter driven, this one was yeah. abolitionist driven. Um, and they called this the first parliamentary slave code. And they, this was because it was the first um, act of parliament which directly affected the enslaved population. And with this, um, again, they wanted to protect families from being separated. They wanted to protect enslaved women from being whipped mm -hmm. while they were pregnant. And they wanted to ensure they had conditions where they would naturally increase. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so the third phase would be actually during the, um, the Abolition Act, the Abolition of Slavery Act. So this comes up to 1833. This is when apprenticeship is going on. Yep. And so what we see here is a pullback from, mm -hmm. <laughs> from what's happened before. So because now they're at a, a stage where they know, okay, yes. the regime is going to end. Now we're not going to make sure they naturally increase because it's whatever. What we want now is for them to work. <laughs> we exactly. don't want them to leave the plantation. We want to ensure we can extract as much as we can within these years we're given um, for apprenticeship. And, and this was supposed to be the period of transition, transitory labor, moving from bond labor to wage labor. That's right. So this was the, the third phase. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the third phase yes. later on. But yes. you no, know, thank you for that, because it does give the, the foundation yes. as to how everything progressed onwards. So yeah. Now we're going to, get, I guess, get into the key provisions of this sure. British parliamentary legislation that specifically yes. address the condition of the enslaved women in the British Caribbean. Yeah, sure. So in phase one, the legislation, which primarily addressed women, um, since their offspring inherited their status, um, it mostly concerned uh, pregnant women. So it tried to encourage motherhood and the promotion of a sound family um, by offering monetary incentives um, to enslave parents. So again, you know, we have to talk about the, the fact that the white colonial settlers could no longer obtrude the family and, and this prevented them from being sexually molested, or yeah. abused, and this, you know, the inequality of that power relationship because you have, you know, the enslaved owner over the enslaved person, you know. Mm -hmm. Finally, there was a law stating like, you know, leave them alone, basically. Exactly. <laughs> leave them alone, let, it, let them try to have their own family, their own family life and so forth. Um, Jamaica in particular had um, various inducements to produce uh, fertility and they had reduction in hours of work. They provided baby clothing, extra allowances for food. Um, and for pregnant and nursing women, they gave them bottles of rum, um, advancements of cash rewards, especially for those who got pregnant many times. So yes. Uh -huh. Um, I know, for instance, I know in Trinidad, if you got pregnant more than three times, your hours would be reduced. Um, and if you were over five months, you weren't allowed to leave the plantation. Mm -hmm. Um, but um in, in in some states, if you had more than six or seven children, yes. you weren't re required to work at all. So this was supposed to be the overall mm -hmm. rule. In both phases. 
in both phases, this was supposed to be the norm. If you had more than six or seven children, you no longer needed to work, providing that the children stayed on the plantation of your owner. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they couldn't be um, moved anywhere else. And then you would receive money after yeah. each successful birth. But mind you, the planters got a tax relief on for that. On, for that. Mm -hmm. So they also gained from this provision. And Grenada was similar to um, to Jamaica in this regard, the same sort of incentives. And also the same for um, the Leeward Islands. Mm -hmm. um, what they had also is that they had a law stipulating that enslaved women um, were not allowed to be whipped. Um, or any kind of severe punishments, they could only be um, punished by confinement. So they had to be confined yeah. to an area. Um, anything that um, alleviated, anything that was too uh, violent. Yeah. Yeah, it's just uh, interesting all these different um, stipulations that are indicated as yeah. to how that, um, especially a woman that was enslaved, as to how they would probably have better treatment although mm -hmm. sometimes that didn't necessarily um come about so to speak yes. right mm -hmm. so and then you know we'll go i guess further into i guess the british le legislation the impact the, the treatment of the enslaved women in terms of l their labor and yes. living conditions and well-being yes so in terms of labor um i've mentioned it less than their work hours especially mm -hmm. if they had more than three kids they were not allowed to work um, longer hours, the, the, the full length of hours of the day, or to do hard labor when pregnant. And again, if they had more than six children, um, they were not allowed to work at all and they would receive money. Now, this is providing that these colonies follow this rule. Yeah. So this is all well and good written and, and, and to be you know implemented throughout the British island. Whether or not this was adhered to is another story, but but this is what it said in terms of labor. Labor was supposed to be easier for them, you know. They're not supposed to be on their feet as often, and you know it, the conditions were supposed to be better. Um, in terms of their living conditions, well, those that didn't have housing already were had houses built for them. Yeah. Um, where they became pregnant, so this this was a huge thing, um, because before you just you you got where you were given mm -hmm. <laughs> you had to a lot of times you had to share but no yeah. as an incentive to get them to you know procreate more exactly. they were given their own housing and so forth they were allowed to to marry and to have a sustained family life yeah and also um in the second phase they were um there was a preclusion of um enslaved owners from selling um uh, family members which would cause them to be separated so whether it was a husband a wife exactly. and kids they had to if they had to sell one they had to sell all or mm -hmm. they had to keep them yeah. again whether this was followed verbatim <laughs> one does not know but but this yeah. is what was written mm -hmm. um and in terms of the overall well-being um well i would believe if they no longer were given um harsh punishments this should have had a better effect on, on their psyche, on, on their overall health, you know. Um, and also, um, you know, if they had the chance to be, to have a family and to have their own homes and to also be given gifts, receive mm -hmm. monetary rewards, they probably could have afforded a bit more, um, um, you know, of their needs than what was, you know, just given to them by virtue of being an enslaved person. So again, all these things were written. Yes. <laughs> Whether or not they were adhered to is uh, the question. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we'll go a little bit more into the the mental health state because there was a lot of other things that were going on that, uh, you know, women try to do to yes. kind of forge their own path as well yeah. within the confines of slavery. So right now we'll just yeah. go into the, I guess, what did the legislation provide in terms of any protections or remedies against the physical and sexual abuse? I know that you mentioned this, some of this before, but to just go a little bit more into that, what they suffered as the enslaved in the British yeah. Caribbean. Yes, I think what I need to mention first and foremost mm -hmm. is that even if they said that they no longer wanted women to be whipped, um, this was not removed yeah. as being illegal. So this was still done because they still had a legal basis for this in the enslaved courts, mm -hmm. you know? So um, 
in one hand saying that they no longer wanted to do that by having ameliorative laws were very, it was, yes. it was quite a contradiction to what was our, already on the book saying that they were allowed to be whipped and this was not repealed. This was not removed, yeah. you know, so they had a legal basis for continuing to do that. Um, so again, it, it'll be repeating what we spoke about earlier mm -hmm. in, in the phase one, you know, they had protection against the, the, the men could not, white, the white men could not um, obtrude in their family life. They faced fines, but again, they faced fines and not any other form of punishment, not jail time or anything, you know, um, not to be whipped themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> in that case. Um, uh, for um, if, if they did uh, obtrude, which it's quite possibly they did. Yeah. Um, they just had to pay money um, in order to um, get out of that. Um, I know in Grenada, they had this office called the Guardian of the Slaves, mm -hmm. um, which was similar to the uh, another office that they had in Trinidad and in British Guyana, which was called the Protector of the Slaves. And okay. within that system, the enslaved persons could go complain if they had excessive punishments or if they were treated unfairly or, you know, um, if they were sexually abused, physically abused, any shape, way, shape or form, they were allowed to bring this to yes. um, those protectors. Again, whether this was, this brought about justice, um, we will discuss that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we will discuss that further. Um, but the point is, you know, um, these mechanisms were there that were not there before. Um you know, one of the, the biggest things, again, was the non-whipping, as I mentioned before. Yes. And, and, and and there's an example of a Jamaican case where um, you had this lady, Betsy Chambers, um, who um, was beaten while she was pregnant and she yeah. miscarried. And so she brought a complaint and the complaint was thrown out because they said the owner had no idea she was pregnant when he whipped her. They was because again they did not um prioritize and save um testimony. Yes. So exactly. safe post then allowed um safe testimony, even though she had witnesses that said we knew she was pregnant, everyone knew she was pregnant. Um, this was not allowed as evidence. So yeah. he got away with it. Contrary. Yeah. It's it's yeah. this contradiction, right? Exactly. It's, contradiction well, again. Yeah. 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 So the mechanisms were there, but whether they were effective or enforced is is the question. Yes. Yeah. And we see with Betsy, she did not get justice. No. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And then um, I know that um, this kind of, I guess, goes to partially to Betsy, but again, if there's any examples of where there were notable instances where the enslaved women used the British legislation to seek legal redress or assert yes. their rights in the mm -hmm. British Caribbean during this period. Yes, so um, I have two instances from British Guyana. Um, there's a legal, there's a historian, sorry, called Randy S. Brown, and he did quite an intricate um, delve into um, British Guyana, Burbese in particular, mm -hmm. during their ameliorative period. And there were two cases that stuck out to me. There was one called um, a lady called a Creole lady. They they um, describe her as a Creole domestic called Princess. Mm. And she complained in June 20, 1822 that she was horsewhipped um, for absolutely no reason. Um, the owner apparently just explained to the judge, which was called a fiscal, that um, she was insolent. Um, and that's why he horsewhipped her. And the, the fiscal thought this was reason enough. He said, you know, that she came and complained uselessly. Mm -hmm. And if she did it again, you know, then she would face she would then face a punishment for this because she basically wasted her time, you know. But what was what was interesting in reading um, Brown's work is that that did not deter enslaved women from still complaining Perfect. because there were other enslaved women like Princess who got no justice, but they complained a second time. Mm -hmm. I think um, he noted that there was one woman, an enslaved woman, who said she was complaining because it was her right. Exactly. <laughs> she knew that was her right. And she did not care whether she got any justice or not. She was going to use the mechanism that she never had before. Exactly. So this was also their form of, you know, resistance. And it was a mm -hmm. form of agency for them. Um, and then there was another case with a woman called Rouge. And with her, again, like Betsy, she was flogged when she was pregnant. Now, 
the entire, apparently that the entire plantation laborers were flogged for not finishing a task on time. But yeah. the driver, the driver who was the, the person sort of like, it was a black overseer. He said to the planter at the time, this woman is heavily pregnant. I think she was five months. She's visibly pregnant, he said. And he said, I don't care. Beat her till blood comes out. Oh my. And so that's what happened. And the next day she complained that she was having lower stomach and groin pains. So they sent her to the doctor. And the doctor examined her and said she was fine. He said she can go back to work. And he doesn't think sitting down would do her any good. So they sent her back to work and she miscarried. And because she was five months or even more, she had to have a stillborn. She had to give birth to this baby. And the baby was completely broken up. Mm -hmm. And not from deformity. It was from the beating. From the beating. Yeah. So the baby's limbs were broken. As small as it was, you can see it. They, they said it was visibly um, broken. And so she complained. She complained. And the judge said that he was um, negligent in his duty, mm -hmm. um, but not hostile and not cruel. Amazing. And so he was fined. So he just had to pay money. And that was it. He, they said there was no evidence to show that he knew she was pregnant, even though the driver said, I yeah. told him, the driver did say, I told him she was. Yeah. And this is what he said. And he said, that's not, that's basically black evidence against white. And they lie. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, I can only imagine for what other women would have seen this particular instance exactly. and what their, you know, their whole mentality to say that it doesn't uh, for me to have a child is not worth it right no. to bring in this type of an environment this hostile yes. environment exactly. that before my child is even birthed this is what is going on it's going on exactly exactly yeah. yeah and that's what they had to face you know yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's one of these topics that are just, I mean, it's uncomfortable to, to, you know, to discuss and to talk about it because it did mm -hmm. happen, but it's, well, it just shows in terms of, you know, their, this type of resistance that most would have had to, to think about to say before even having, you know, mm -hmm. a child. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I, you know, in the Slave Act of, you know, 1807, you know, there was three major stipulations via this order of council. Yes. Would you be able to just discuss, you know, these points and why they were so important? Sure. So the first was the outline of whipping. <laughs> um, uh, well, we saw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll go more into that. Yes. The second was the introduction of colonial hospitals and Western medicine to regulate um, um the births and also mm -hmm. the introduction of midwifery. Yes. And the third was the continuation of pronatalist measures, so measures to um to promote natural increase. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, so if we go to the first one, the outline of whipping, again, this wasn't followed. And you would read when I when I when I read and when I researched um documents on whether this was followed, there were a lot of complaints of planters, like the Jamaican planters were very against this yeah. very against because they said oh we don't have to whip them heavily what was heavily to them i mean look what happened to betsy chambers exactly in jamaica, right yeah. um and and this was throughout the islands you know it's just i can say the jamaicans were were very vocal about it in in in, in writing but it, this this was not adhered to throughout the islands you know yeah. they still beat their um the enslaved women pregnant or not mm -hmm. yeah um, and in terms of um, introducing colonial hospitals, um, the enslaved women found this to be extremely isolating yeah. because what I noticed in um, in researching uh, women, enslaved women, and, and when it comes to childbirth and child rearing, um, it's very much a community thing that yes. they brought over from Africa. Mm -hmm. So they liked giving birth amongst the other enslaved women they like to be taken care of yeah. by enslaved women and also by herbalists that they call obia people because mm -hmm. they took care of them they took care yes. of them 
during and, and, and postnatal, they give them postnatal care as well. They give them all the relevant herbs and stuff to drink. Um, so they like that. When they introduce them to the hospital system and then the lying in room after they give birth, they felt all alone, you of know. Course. Um yeah. if you heard the um the people that were for this, um the, a lot of the abolitionists talk about, you know, oh, the hospitals and <laughs> midwifery centers in England or where there's, you know, there's such care and there's such peace and there's such quiet. And, you know, you cannot you cannot compare uh, a European setting of a hospital to one based in uh, an island where people are still enslaved and then say, yeah. you know, they should be happy for this. They were not, you know, they mm -hmm. were not. Um, if the midwives happen to be trained um black persons they felt a little bit more at peace with this but on a whole they were very they had a huge aversion to the system and the last part when it came to um the continuation of pronatalist measures again you know the incentives of you know all these all these things from you know you if you give birth to so much children you would not have to work, but then how much in, in especially in the in the British Caribbean, how much women had more than six children? Exactly. Not a lot. Um, because again, this was not something that they encouraged before, before yeah. the slave trade ended. So it was far and few between. And even in some islands where women had five children, they were being forced. There, mm -hmm. there was a there was an instance when a reverend spoke about he saw them stood up <laughs> in like a center and he when he passed the first time he asked them what are you doing there and they didn't answer him he passed yeah. back and saw them still there and he said they're not working and I you know reading this I thought but surely they shouldn't have been allowed to work because exactly. they had all these children but but this this goes to show that there was still an expectation for yes. them to work despite the fact of having more than three children where they were where um the law says since um since that occasion they should have be doing less work or none at all so and no, then I because this if, if we go up to um the uh apprenticeship apprenticeship um period um they started taking back the monetary incentives then because yeah. <laughs> they said okay if slavery is ending we no longer need to give them money to yeah. have children you know because we'll yeah. probably have to end up paying them eventually. Exactly. <laughs> yes, it, came, it became more of a money exchange more than it was. Else. It was. Yeah. It was. It was. It was. So yeah. So they had those those three, you know, very um, explicit um, measures. But again, how effective were there is that uh, you can see from records and archives. Exactly, because yeah, I, awesome. I know, especially your, the the second point that you make in regards to these hospitals that were mm -hmm. created. I mean, very different from what they know from their own um, homelands to be exactly. able to see where it was more of a community. It was mm -hmm. more people coming together. Yeah. It was more friendlier mm -hmm. as opposed to being really stark and cold mm -hmm. and and all of those very sterile in exactly. terms of in that type of an environment where exactly. they, it's more they know of it's a community event, exactly. right? Where yeah. they get to lean on people and people are there for that type of birthing coming yes. through, right? Exactly. So this now leads into the the resistance that yes. most you know women would have felt seeing something like that, knowing that that's not their innate way yes. of bringing life into being. Yes. You know, what can you, I guess, speak to, I guess, the, you know, for attempting to have their, you know, control of their lives in their directions Yes, because yes. your article does illustrate some of these instances of them yes. refusing you know to have offspring and what yes. they would do can you just mm -hmm. like I know you mentioned a bit a bit a bit of it in regards with the obia and the yes but can you go a little bit more into that for us sure of course so enslaved women found whatever way they could to control their path when it came to you know, child bearing and child rearing. Um, so a lot of pregnant women who are forced to work, regardless of the law saying that, you know, they should be, you know, have less, you know, labor and so forth. What they did, they went on sort of like go slows. So they would work really slowly. You know, they were complaining, you know, not feeling too well, so I can't do it so fast. They, so they tried to use any mechanism that was at hand, you know. 
and and those who had um more than five children who were supposed to be exempted from work. As I said before, there were occasions where um, they were still required to work and they just refused. They either refused straight up or they'll be really slow about it, you know, or they'll work intermittently. That was, that was again, that was their way. Um, and some conscience, consciously um, limited the number of children they had. Um, and they did this again through whatever, whatever means were at the, their disposal. Um, it was reported that some of them used obia. <laughs> um, so they used persons who had, you know, this knowledge of African practices that will help them with, with medicines and powders and potions and rubs and so forth, yeah. whereby it, it can help them either not conceive or if they did it would be uh, an abortion aid. Yes. And there was even mention of certain plants like um, cassava. They said, they said it's the esoteric use of this thing. So again, it passed down from, um, they, they said from mother to daughter, yes. you know? And so it's what either through that means or through the means of a herbalist, they will tell you how to use cassava, how to use green pineapple, um, Barbados pride, um, passion flower and wild tansy and this was this enabled them not to have children yeah. you know um and what was what i found interesting um as a means of, re of resistance and and tying back to the african tradition was the weaning process mm -hmm. um i found this very interesting that they used this as a means not to return to the plantation as quickly so yes. um again in africa and depending on on the tribe, the weaning process ran anywhere from a year to two years. And during this period, it it ran um, coincided with also abstaining from sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. So this um, did two things for them. It it first um, enabled them not to go back to work immediately, at least for two years. Yes. And two, not to have have sexual intercourse and in that regard not to get pregnant quickly again so it controlled uh, their ability to have children now the planters hated this absolutely yeah. hated this they would um because many of them had uh, a lot of stereotypical and racist ideologies about africans african women they thought that africans were the closest to the animal species and so yeah. Just like dogs, they give birth and they'll be up the next day and they can go back to labor. Mm -hmm. And the African women, the enslaved women, I should say, were very, they pushed against this. No, this is our process. We have to wean. And so they use this pronatalist measure to their advantage by sticking it out. Um, I know in some instances, some of the planters um, constructed weaning houses <laughs> so that yes. they can do this quickly for a couple of months. But they did not like that. They did not attend. Of course. And um, this did not fare very well. So I, I found this to be extremely interesting that this was a measure that they used um, and successfully so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I, I mean, to be under such harsh, yeah. um, oppressive conditions. Yeah. And this was the way that they could be able to have some power back mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. use the law as best as they could to mm -hmm. their advantage, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Definitely. it's just uh, very much so a very interesting period, but at the same time, just shows the resilience. Yes. And what they had, what they used, all what they had. All what they their, had. All what they had. Mm -hmm. In order for their own survival. Yes. And for, again, why we're even here for the survival of the group entirely. Yes, exactly. Perfect. Um, yeah. No, no. Do you have another point or? No, I was going. I was just going to say, um, just tying back to the whole, um, amelioration and trying to make it better for them. You know. Yes. Out, out and in outlawing something like whipping, um, they instituted some what what was a an English, um, punishment in the workhouses called the treadmill, mm -hmm. um, whereby it was you know a revolving um ring that they would bound their hands to and they had to keep walking as it turned but they also call this the shin scraper because many times if you stumble it will remove the shin the skin off your shin yes and many women tumbled on this while pregnant and miscarried 
So in trying to have these pronatalist measures, they brought in measures that were equally, if not as destructive and, you know, um, punishery as whipping. And even the other forms of punishment they brought in during this era as confinement, they confined them in what they call a dark hole. They yeah. would put them there up to three days, like, you know, what that did to their mental, to their, you know, to their psyche. Yes you know, alone in a hole for days or or they what they, they call it, they put them in the stocks. Um again in certain very abandoned buildings or buildings with lots of um uh raw materials again tied or bound. Yeah. Or they bound them um where they wanted to embarrass them, they would put um metal plates on their necks and their and their feet and have them stretched out for days, like stood in like a market square or something like that. Yep. Again, um, when they had some of these things removed, a lot of their skin came off of it, you know. It was absolutely horrible. Um, so it, I don't know how much better this was than than flogging them because mm -hmm. it was demeaning because yes. a lot of them were done in public. And, and on top of that, it was painful. You know? Of course. Yeah. Of so. course. Yeah, and that's definitely would have caused in terms of this type of resistance because yes. to see that... And to know the the extent that uh, a planter would go in terms of punishment to them is just uh, unimaginable. Exactly, is unimaginable. Yeah. And now, just finally, just to kind of you know wrap it up, you know, when people are, I guess, researching in this type of an area, and I guess, I guess the time, not the time frame, but I guess the headspace that they need to be in when they're because again you're seeing things that are very disturbing you're reading mm -hmm. things that are very disturbing that are very yeah. you know passion you're passionate about you're reading across and you're just you know as for myself I get very emotional when I see some yes. of these things um and you're reading these in public places sometimes or and you're just you know reacting you yeah. know what kind of advice you know you would give to anybody well I believe if you want to study colonial slavery or any elements of this this time span in history, you have to have an open mind that you will meet a lot of things that are traumatic, mm -hmm. a lot of things that are painful. Um, you know, the word slavery itself, you know, brings up a lot of angst in a lot of people, a lot of anxiety, a lot of feelings. Um you tend to hear a lot of people saying it's a thing of the past, but yes. it's really it's it's really important to note that it's a horrible thing to read. Yeah. Um, especially if that is your ancestry. Yes. Um, I believe it would hit you even more. I think if it, it even if it's not, it's not pleasant, mm -hmm. you know. So I think one has to keep an open mind that you would not find any pleasantry. Exactly. Um, you're going for the story. You're going because you want to tell it as it is. So you also have to be, um, you have to be objective in how you tell it, but at the same exactly. time, you have to be true to the source. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't water it down. Neither can you dramatize, you know, dramatize it. You have to state it as it is because how it is, is bad enough. Exactly. You know, so exactly. just, just tell it, tell it as it is. But I would say, Keep an open mind that you won't find great things. You would find things that you didn't know. <laughs> you exactly. Know? You'll find discoveries, but it won't be great. Exactly. You know, it won't be things to run home no. about. Yeah. So I would say once you have that in mind, then go forth. <laughs> yes, absolutely. No, yes. I agree. I agree. And I, those are really great uh, words of encouragement for anybody that is researching this time frame period, because it definitely is you're trying to give yourself a pep talk for what you will be uncovering and what you will yes. be seeing once you get past certain uh, barriers, so to speak, and delving further in. But again, Justine, I really want to appreciate Thank you so much. And to I really do appreciate your time to talk about this because I know you have much, lots more. And as well, I'll link your this particular article as well as other articles that others can read and yes. to know, you know, to get a much better understanding of this sure. particular time period. Sure. 
period sure. as well. Okay. Sure. So thank you thank so you much. So much. Thank you for having me. Not a problem. Pleasure. Take care. Mm-hmm. Hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please make sure to like, follow, subscribe, and write a review for the episode wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you.